welcome to the Equestrian Experience, a show where we talk about what happens behind the rosettes and what we've tried so that you don't have to. In a world first, we and our guests will be openly sharing what we know from our extensive equestrian experience. This includes our exclusive access to our global experts, such as high performance national vets, coaches, farriers, and even brands. If you're new here, consider subscribing. We are hosts, Amanda Ross and Bex Mason, and today we are talking to a family of incredibly high-achieving eventers who have a passion for thoroughbreds. Please welcome Blair, Nikki, Charlie Richardson of Vantage Hill Thoroughbreds and Eventers. How are you guys? Good. Hi, Amanda. Good. We're all good. Thank you. Good night. And Bex? Hey. Hi, guys. Thanks for coming on. Can't wait to talk to you about all things thoroughbred and eventing today. We thought we might start with a little bit of a how do we know each other. So um, so you guys are from New South Wales and I'm from Victoria and from as long for as long as I can remember, Nikki, you and I always evented together from when we were super young and then all of a sudden Blair came on the scene and then suddenly there's the boys on the scene as well and now there's this whole Richardson family. So we've known each other forever, huh? <laughs> I know. Um, I still remember, Amanda, when we went to Tasmania, was it? I was when thinking we, about that. <laughs> yeah, we were bunking somewhere. I can't even remember what it was, but we had to ride some, some horses. It was the, the Tasmanian Pony Club Championships and you right. and Heath and I were invited as bait-sponsored riders and we were, remember That's we were right. given pool horses to ride yeah, and yeah. we did the event on it. And yeah. remember, I was thinking about this, I was just laughing my butt off. You and I shared a room and I remember yeah. when we were chatting that night, it was like being at some school camp, chatting and I know. Night, you were telling me about this really nice guy called Blair that you just met and how lovely he was. Oh, <laughs> I'm glad that came up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's hilarious. I'm glad you remembered that because it was the first thing I thought of. I'm like, oh my god, how long ago was that? He's a keeper. Yeah. I know. Well, yeah. So you know, you and I have been competing against each other and with each other since um, you know we were probably both 18. I think we're the same age, and. Um, yeah, it's always lovely to catch up with you. And, um, yeah, as for Blair, he rocked up on the scene in, in 2000, 2000, I think. Yeah. yeah. God, back yeah. then. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Well, you've done all right then, Blair. Yeah. You're still here. <laughs> still here. Yeah, still going. Fantastic. So we've mm. got you guys on the pod today because we wanted to talk um, to you not only about um, – you guys getting together as a like a performance horse family, but also that you've got a huge involvement with the um, the racehorse industry and also the off the track um, thoroughbreds that you'll then turn over into amazing sport horses. So, can you tell us a little bit what you guys do at your property, Vantage Hill? Um, basically, uh, we break in and pre train is basically all we do. We break in a lot of horses a year. Um, we have them back through. We educate them in the barriers, um, and most of our horses go into the, the Sydney trainers. And we do it mainly for the bigger horse yeah. studs. You know, we're lucky. We live in Scone, the horse capital of Australia, um, yeah. and so we 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 do them basically for all the, the bigger stud farms, um, and then send them into to the Sydney trainers. Um, mm -hmm. Is is what we do here. Yeah. I'm just wondering on this um, on your breaking breaking and pre-training yard, like how many horses do you, can you break in within a year? Um, look, we probably last year I think we did about 250. I think on an average year Whoa. we might break in a couple of hundred. <laughs> um, it, yeah. it is it, it's pretty busy and pretty full on throughout the year. Now we're in our quiet time of year um, through till January, and then out of all the yearling sales start um, in January. And so we're busy right through sort of to August, um, breaking in and, and pre-training, yeah. Well, that must be one hell of a setup. And what organisation skills to kind of be able to produce that many horses from the very start up until yeah. where they start their careers. Um, that is just incredible. Do you have many staff that help you out on the farm too? Or is it just the family well, deal? 
Well, no, <laughs> the family are the kids <laughs> roped in. Um, but, you know, like for last year when we did those 250 horses, we had uh, three guys, three other riders, um, and they're yeah. going pretty much all day um, yeah. with the horses. Yeah. And then we've got other... Yeah. Other staff to muck out and feed up, and we do spellers as well on the property. Um, yeah. yeah, so we we have we have a ground staff team, and then we have our riders. And when we're really busy, we might have um, five ground staff and and four or five riders. Um, mm-hmm. Wow, Blair rides as many as he can before he falls apart. And then, <laughs> and, I'm getting and, older. My date of birth is catching up with me. Yeah, I said, yeah, I'm I'm the admin, the admin lady. I just I'm, I, I try and find the staff and and do the book work and pay the wages and do all that sort of stuff. But um, wow, what a huge setup you've got over there! And tell us about your facilities that you've got for all these horses that you start off. Um, yeah, look, we've got a lot of stables and yards. We've got a couple of round yards um, undercover. We've got, we got three round yards, two undercover. Um, and it, it's more about a system. And so you're starting a horse and you don't start them a big lot all at once. There'll be new horses coming in every week. And so they're just got the gear on and being driven and lunged and then you've got horses going to our track. And so they're all at different stages, which actually makes it okay. easier. And so you can be more efficient to get through a number of horses um, like that. Yeah. yeah. Is it like a kid at school, like, I don't know, nursery school, and then the next stage, and then they're in the college, and then they're at the university, but yeah, going exactly. through the stages at your yard. Yeah. yeah. And Charlie, <laughs> do you get thrown on a few of them as well? Yeah, I get, I usually ride, oh, half a dozen pre-trainers in the morning and then after that I ride my own ones, which usually takes me up until about lunchtime. Oh, excellent. So you must be loving the lockdown then. Yeah, no, it's good fun. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you're in lockdown, so when are you fitting in school or is that you're on holidays? You just push that to the side a bit so you can ride all the horses while you're not at boarding school? Yeah, I push that back as far as I can before school <laughs> starts. Usually cramming it on the last night. Of holidays, uh, good job. <laughs> and, um, and he, Charlie managed to give one its um, its first ride, like a breaker that hadn't been ridden this year in the round yard. Given the fit, so he was on. He was jumping on a few a breaker as well. Oh, you know. good job! What so, Charlie? What do you like doing best with all of the ones off the track that you get there? So obviously you've been you've been involved in it for a while. So what what's your favourite part of, of the thoroughbred industry? Oh, I think just well the horses themselves they're like they're great and they've got a lot of potential to go a long way. So I like like all the breakers and pre trainers that come through our system. I like seeing ones here and there and going oh this could be an event or, or, and then like seeing its progress. And if it's not a good race horse, I'd hit dad up to see if he could bring it back and <laughs> give it a rehome or just stuff like that. I enjoy doing that and the excitement with it. So what do you look for in a thoroughbred that you think is going to turn event horse when you first see them come in? Um, well, I personally like to, to see like a long legged, scopey type of horse um in australia sprint racing sprinters are a big thing there's a lot of 1200 meter races and these horses are more nuggety muscly types of horses and though so that type of horse for us in the eventing world and the your jumping world um they're not so scopey in the respect that you want to jump them and they don't tend to move um that that well, well for dressage yeah. where but they're really fast like you would ride you'll ride one and you go oh this one little canter <laughs> <laughs> it'll burn around the, it will just burn around the track and win big races um yeah. so like i like to see a bigger type of horse a longer legged rangier type yeah. that it looks like which, it could cover the which ground. is which is becoming less and less 
mm. in in Australia. They're breeding more sprinters okay. and not stayers. So it is actually harder to to find those um, thoroughbred types that right. will become eventers. Mm. Yeah. I, I agree with you. I don't, you know, I'm not at the track and looking as anywhere near the amount of horses that you are, but it definitely seems the days of the leggy English stayer um a, a definitely you know we don't have yeah. them as much Blair if I had to do yeah. dressage or something that you're describing the canners like this I just yeah. think it's pleasant. <laughs> yeah ab absolutely like we, we just had a had to um come back to us to that we liked as breakers and um and they've completely developed and changed and mm. um they're still nice types and nice horses but but they they're you know they can't move or they they mm. um they're, they're they're nuggety and and you know they're sprinters they're not they're not mm. those rangy eventer types so yeah it's interesting how how i, I love that word you use nuggety that's something i've never really used over here but i do get that's what you like mean like just, yeah like nuggety like compact and just yeah yeah we're, we're just doing the impressions today <laughs> yeah, well, they're, they're, yeah they're not as yeah. tall they're 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 mm. very compact and some of those compact ones are are little rippers mm. but um mm. they mm. they don't compete against um the the purpose-bred performance horses these days yeah. Mm, yeah. When and the horses come to you for breaking, what age do you start them at? Oh, uh, look, they've just been through the yearling sales and they're probably okay. 18 months old. Yeah. Um, so they are they're very young. Yeah. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, I remember I was over in New Zealand for a bit many years ago, actually, and we used to have some breakers in and yeah, they come and they just seem so tiny and they almost just feel like, well, I don't know, they're just, they're, they're mini horses. I mean, they're not like the warm bloods that take a lot longer to develop. Like you wouldn't think of breaking in a big show jumping warm blood at a year at a year old or 18 months old. But the thoroughbreds just develop that much quicker, don't they? The big races, it's all two-year-old races. And so mm -hmm. as two-year-olds, they're out there racing. All the money is in the two-year-old uh, racing. So they need okay. to, um, the trainers need these horses broken in early and going um yeah and it, and it probably makes it easier to break them in because they're not they're not big strong horses out of control um no. the, the thoroughbreds are actually easier to break in yeah than the yeah because yeah because yeah. they're babies like some of them actually do look like foals but um yeah <laughs> if they've gone through a sales prep and through a sales they they they're they're all built up and muscly yeah. and ready to be and they've been in. handled so, a lot from a young age as well i suppose rather than like the three-year-old that's been out in the field for three years it's spent three years of its life not mm -hmm. being handled and then you start that process whereas obviously the thoroughbred since they're a year or well, before that probably six months old they've always been handled yeah. they've been in, in that environment and it makes everything a lot easier and um yeah nice process for them i suppose yeah, yeah. Mm, absolutely yeah and um, once, so when you guys have got these youngsters and they're two years old, um, what sort of age, if you pick one that you want to come back, would you like to start it with its eventing? So obviously you get them and you train them purely as a racehorse. And then what do you do? What age do you want to start training them as, as an eventer? And what are you going to do differently or build upon what you've already done as a racehorse to start changing them once you get them? Well, I reckon four-year-old... Um is a is a good age you know that they the trainers have known if they're going to be sacked because they're too slow they're normally by that age that's about the age that they're they're not going to continue their racing career mm -hmm. that's a good age to um get a horse um, as you know amanda like when you get them up the grades it takes four years to get them up to four star mm -hmm. level um so by then they're sort of eight nine year old mm -hmm. and then they're for them to build on that career at that level, they're only coming into their prime at 12 year old. So um, then they're really experienced. So I, I think, sort of think that four or five year old mark is a really good age to um, to get them going. And they're young enough too, they're not too old and 
other problems mm-hmm. with them, then it's a good age to start them. Mm-hmm. And then what's the first thing you do with them? So not that I've done a lot of work with them actually on the track, but I sort of assuming it's relatively basic, it's straight lines. Do you sort of do any work with them if you think that they're a bit of an interesting horse on the arena before they go off as a racehorse or do you wait to do any arena work with them once you've got them after they've finished racing? Well, actually, part of in our breaking in system, um, they actually go to our arena on week two um, oh. before they go to, down to our track. So mm-hmm. they're on our arena at week two. They go to the track um, the last day of week two, and then they have a couple of weeks on the track. So we see them up on the arena then. Um, mm-hmm. But if you've got a horse from that has been in racing and it comes back to you to try it, basically, yes, take it up to the arena and, mm-hmm. like you said, go straight. A lot of them want to go sideways. So you, you can figure a lot out in the first mm-hmm. ride um, mm-hmm. if you can straighten them up and their temperament um, up on the arena anyway. Yeah, yeah. And do you jump them straight away? So do you jump them on them? Do you give them a free jump? Like how do you test if you think that they're going to have it, um, enough scope as a jumper? Well, Blair gets on and he'll go up to the <laughs> arena and, and, I'll, and he'll go do a few laps and he go, righto, put the jump up. <laughs> so, I mean, but you get those you get those horses if they show a natural talent from the first jump, then you just go, mm. yeah, that's keeper. Um, we watch it go around the arena, and if it's got an ordinary trot, we go, oh well, maybe it can jump. So we'll, yeah, we will yeah. test it and see if it can jump. But these days we're a lot fussier. Back when we were eighteen and. 19 and 20 we just took any horse that we could um but like i said the thoroughbreds aren't they're not bred the same anymore um Mm. so they've got to be very special they've got to be really good jumpers and they've they've got to be able to trot for us to want to keep it yeah yeah they've got to be able to move yeah actually move how long do they need after racing to kind of mentally and physically adjust to a new life and eventing? Well, I think it just depends on the individual horse's temperament. Um, you know, some horses aren't going to make the adjustment because they're, they're too revved up and they're too hot. And mm. you know, some horses are naturally very quiet and so that horse will you can you can make the transition quite quickly um just yeah. because it's got it's got the temperament um and other horses will take longer um to make that transition into it yeah um if i don't know about you over there but here in england i mean often the race horses sometimes have coming off the track have maybe a bad reputation they say okay they're quite a buzzy horse so thoroughbreds in general are known over here for being oh it's moth track it must be a bit crazy but in my personal experience as well actually some of the nicest horses i've had have come off the track because they've already had that experience of being on the race course in that environment and they would just be you know lovely brains they've been on and off a horse truck a few times they've you know been well handled um would you think that do you think that's a positive thing for them coming from a racetrack into the career it makes it a little bit easier uh, yeah, I do. I think, it, you know, they have learned how to gallop um, and uh, that they're exposed to a lot of things in, in their racing career. Um, and obviously some horses handle it um, better than others, which will then make the transition to an eventing horse or jumper or what a pony club horse, whatever it may be. And some horses will just yeah. not 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 make that transition because they are – too revved up no so what is the difference like if you're looking for a thoroughbred off the track that you wanted to do like low level hacking what would you look for in that type of horse to one that you're looking we've already said about the elite event horse that you want it to be scopy and have a nice trot um and if you just want something more just do some happy hacking some local level pony club what would you then look for in the horse and does it matter if it's had previous injuries so much 
So for well, if you're sort of just doing like, as you said, fun. going out hacking, not doing any like um, high intensity things, you'd sort of not. Depends what the injury was, but if it's just a small injury, I wouldn't really worry about it. Mm. And then yeah, and also um, yeah, when I'd look for like just a quiet horse, I'd want a good temperament so that I could be safe and be confident with what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. I think that is very important, isn't it? And the temperament comes through in kind of all sports and disciplines and what you're going to aim the horse to do in the future. So what would you would you guys say? So we've talked a little bit about the elite rider taking on, you know, the thoroughbred and what we're looking like. If you have someone that is um, more of an everyday rider and like Charlie said, they've chosen that off the track horse for its thoroughbred, for its temperament, yeah. what would you say the first thing that they should do with that horse is when they get it home and they're trying to transition it? Like what sort of work should they be doing with it? What should they expect? Well, I reckon they need to... If you're just talking your amateur person, person um, I reckon they need to get to know it. So they want to saddle it, lunge it first, Keep just it get to know it. its temperament. Uh, we're lucky here because we can just put them in a uh, put them in a round yard and give give them a lunge, no matter what. Yep. If I'm trying a horse um, as to see if it's good enough for an equestrian horse, I just take it straight to the round yard, give it a lunge before I hop on. Yep. Um, anything so you know we're, so we're lucky with the facilities but I reckon if someone hasn't got those facilities they can get it in the arena give it a lunge and just get to know the horse because firstly they've got to think about their own safety they're, they're dealing with a horse that they don't actually know um, and if they can get it used to the environment a bit that they're going to ride it in um, a, they're going to be safer and keep the horse and them safer as well so I would lunge it, lunge it with the saddle on, make sure someone's around when they hop on to ride it um, and get get to know the horse from there. Um, now, <laughs> how do you guys get on them, by the way? This is a really random question. Do you vault on? No. What do you no, no, well, no, uh, not like awesome. Shane. <laughs> I, there's, there's a bit more broken. I'm that Shane. broken um, that I actually have to use a mounting block most of the time, otherwise... I broke my knee, I don't know, six or seven years ago and um, mm -hmm. I had sort of 20-something screws put in there. So I struggle to um, get on. So I use a mounting block and, and some of them are not used to it. And as you climb up next to them, they are looking at you up above them um, and get a bit worried. And so I then just mm. get in the saddle very quietly. But some do look back at you and get a little bit sensitive as you get on um, yeah. with the mounting block. And so you just go quietly again. Yeah, just yeah. purely because they're not used to it. Well, I might get my horses from you off the track because I need a mounting block way too short to be getting <laughs> on or the side of the fence or the bull bar of the car. It yeah. doesn't matter. <laughs> so any off the trackers that you think might suit me, I'll get yeah, them. I <laughs> have to leave mine. <laughs> Well, well, Charlie's got a story. I mean, he he got on one of the pre-trainers in the stable the other day, and oh yeah, yeah well, so it might story. have been midway through the week, and I was waiting for one of our workers. So I was just standing with my horse saddled in the um, stable and waiting for someone else. And I'd been standing there for maybe five minutes, and then I just decided to shove my foot in the iron and climb on. And I think I wasn't like weary enough because I'd just been standing there and my horse had probably gone to sleep and I might have toe poked it a little bit when I got <gasps> on. And it just shoved its head between its Whoops. knees and just started bronking and I had to jump off and Oh my get god. Out. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Did you cling to the side of the stable wall? Were you I just like Spider Man? <laughs> watched it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> oh, that reminds me. I had one that used to flick its tail, and the amount of times I threw the leg over, and as I did that, it flicked its tail and oh, got it caught in my yeah. yeah. oh, And I just thought there were several times I just thought I'm half on, and I've got my spur in its tail, and if I try to pull the spur out of its tail, I think it's going to explode. I just don't want to know, but I'm still here to tell yeah. the tale. But <laughs> that, that's that's a scary situation as well. 
Yeah. Um, and I know here in England now, they've got these classes called retraining of racehorse, the ROR classes. Mm -hmm. And they've actually yeah. become really prestigious, you know, to encourage people to get horses off the track and that have been in the, the racing life for them to go on and do other things. And, you know, they take you to some big, good venues and they have them in show jumping, they have them in showing, they have them in eventing and all um, aimed at the thoroughbred horses. So it is great. And I think, um, yeah, people need to remember that these animals are just so versatile and they're such athletes. And as you were saying, it's a little bit harder to find the event types that you want, but equally there are um, the other types will go on to do all other sorts of jobs like the happy hackers or just the riding club. Um, they can have great temperaments as well, can't they? Yeah, completely, completely. They, they, they are such a versatile yeah. breed. And, and that's happening here as well. Big yeah. time. Yeah, we've got tons of off-the-track classes. Yeah, yeah it's coming through in the jumping and yeah. everything. Yeah, starting to come to And, uh, yeah, Amanda, yeah, you're absolutely. a big part of that down in Victoria. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think, well, Zazi, I mean, she, you know, won so many off-the-track rugs as an eventer and actually as a dressage horse, funnily enough, um, and, yeah, have a have a very big involvement with the off-the-track and the welfare of racehorses um, with the VRC, which is it's actually really lovely and I really enjoy being involved. It's like, Charlie, what you were saying about seeing the the racehorses when they start racing and picking the ones that you yeah. think are going to do the job later on and watching them and following yeah. them. Um, yeah, it is, it's really interesting, isn't it? I mean, I reckon everything I pick, like, guaranteed will come last because it's beautiful and it's on the bit, but it can't run to save self. So, I know you guys must be better at picking a fast one by now than I ever would be. Yeah, it's funny. It's funny they, so we, you know, we have all these thoroughbreds through our system and, and the and the owners um, say, oh, well, you know, what do you think? Will it make a good racehorse? And, and you know, I'll, go, I'll, I'll say, oh, well, it lo it's really pretty and it moves really nicely <laughs> but I've got no idea how fast it's going to run yeah. <laughs> now on the equestrian side of it so Blair you're from New Zealand and Nikki you're Australian and then both five-star riders um, and Nikki you were the at the 1996 games as an individual with the wonderful shampoo so remember his breeding who was he by he had that's why he got his name yeah shampoo. yeah so um, my parents bred him and they owned mm -hmm. the mare champagne and we mm -hmm. bred her to a local polo pony stallion here in Scone called bamboo so we got oh, cool. <laughs> um, and it's a shame that that wasn't his um, registered name, but um, Gordon, my oldest brother, Gordon, produced him um, for a while and registered him as a prelim horse, as wishful thinking. So, um, right. That's, yeah. Well, you got your wish. That's yeah. That's his name. Was he bred as a polo yeah. pony? Was that yeah, his intended yeah. purpose? Yeah. So my dad. Wow. Oh, wow. And my my dad, pony? who's eighty six uh, at the end of the year, he um, mm -hmm. he played a bit of polo as, as as well as being a cattle farmer. Um, he mm -hmm. um, bred his own mm -hmm. polo ponies and. And anyway, he bred shampoo and, and shampoo was tall and gangly and he said he tripped mm -hmm. and said it was a disaster and pretty much <laughs> sucked him. And we actually gave him away to another family for about five years to do pony club with. And then when my oldest brother Gordon decided he dropped out of uni, he, um, he did a bit of... Um, horse pack riding through the mountains and then he decided he might start eventing and went to Heath, um, Heath Ryan and, and he grabbed Shampoo out of the paddock who was 10 at the time. Yeah. And, and then he just um, started with him, broke him down after six months and I think I was about 17 18 by the time I finished school and Shampoo was 12. Um, and I spent four years with him when I left school and got to um, 
96 Olympics four wow. years later. Pretty wow. crazy. Like he was just a special horse. He could he, oh. he just he either won he either, either won an event or was eliminated. Um, so. <laughs> Go what on. an amazing story and amazing journey yeah, for you and that horse, cool. though, and even the horses. Yeah, it was yeah. pretty cool. And I love the fact, too, that, that firstly you got him and, you know, pulled him out of the paddock at yeah. 10. If you if you broke down, he's had an injury that he's come back from. You got him as a 12-year-old yeah. when you were 17, then spent four years and then went to the Olympics. Yeah. Like, Charlie, that's pretty inspiring. Yeah. You've got to go and grab something yeah. out of the paddock now, yeah. mate. Go and yeah. start. <laughs> And what about, um, is, there a, is there a little bit of an argument about how many horses everyone can put on the truck these days? Are you, Charlie, sort of pushing mum and dad slightly out and filling it with a couple more horses? Oh, well, not really. I've poached one. I poached dad's good horse, which I think he was a bit upset about. Yeah. But... Yeah. Was he? And did you did you beat him on it, show jumping? Do you actually, like, go a bit quicker in the jump offs by stealing his horse and then going faster than him? Yes, he does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm finding myself. Better. I'm riding this 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 homebred that Nikki and Charlie now have just palmed off to me. I'm finding Charlie's <laughs> great, my, my older horses. horses. I've trained them, right? <laughs> and... Um, there's this one, and if it's playing up, oh, you can ride that, Blair. I'm like, oh, right. So I get to ride that one and that one. <laughs> but, uh, no. Oh, you must be the best at starting them then, Blair. Uh, well, I'm getting used to it, aren't I? I'm going to have to get a yeah. lot more used to it. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. So, so what about a few quick family questions? So who's the best dressage rider? Probably Nikki. Yeah. Yeah. What about the best show, Charlie? <laughs> yeah. On my oh. horses. Oh well, Blair, you must be. Are you the best cross country rider then? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Fastest to clean stables. Um. Well, that wouldn't be me because I haven't cleaned too many stables. <laughs> That'd be Oscar. <laughs> That'd be Oscar. He wants to get out because he misses half of the shit. <laughs> So not the most efficient. Got to come back and do it twice. <laughs> what about anybody in the morning person? Who's the earliest up in the morning? Me. Yeah, yeah. Night person? Oscar. Um, yeah, that'd be Oscar. He's up late at night all the time. Is, he, is that because he's studying, doing year 12? No. He's late. You would okay. like to think so. Nikki, Nikki actually yes. comes to bed late, but that's because she's had three hours sleep on the couch of a night before she actually Gets comes to bed. To bed. Uh, uh, comes to bed. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Who's the most laid back out of you all? Oh, oh all of you. All of them, I know. Me, maybe. That was a bad question. <laughs> That was brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what about funniest moment in training? Has anyone done anything entirely embarrassing and the rest of the family just stood there and watched? Oh, mm. No, but I do remember once I was at a George Morris clinic. Oh, yeah. And That's I was funny. riding a little horse. You might, well, you might remember him, Amanda Spender. Um, and yes. with, I, with a Kiwi accent. And Spender. I was, I, actually, I was in a lesson with Shane. I think he had Taurus back then and Wendy and Chris Chug. Anyway, George is putting this fence up and at, up at Vicky's. at Vicky's and up and up. And I'm like, oh, God, this is getting far too big for me. And he <laughs> built a vertical related line down to a big oxer. Anyway, I didn't quite get the right distance to the oxer and my little thoroughbred hit the brakes and we crashed through it and I was up its neck holding onto its ears. I nearly pulled the bridle off. Then he built it and I was waiting for him to put it down and I'm feeling rather stupid in front of Chris Chug and Wendy who was on this great jumper at the time. And um, anyway, he said he put it right back up to the same height and said, right, now come around again and just get the right distance, make it work. And, um, and we're talking like a metre 40, not just a metre 20. I was absolutely oh cracking myself. So then I come around and go, I've got to get this right. This is going to look bad if I stop again. Anyway, jumped it. And he said to me, he said, now see everyone? 
if that was a warm blood, I would have had to have put it down because he's on this little tough thoroughbred. I put it back up to the same height. And so, <laughs> oh, <laughs> what an advocate for the thoroughbred. Know, a testament to the thoroughbred. Yeah. And, and he made you jump a triple bar backwards. Yeah. I jumped it one way and then he told me to turn around and jump the triple bar the other way. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Now, you were mentioning, there was something you mentioned, our our, our mate Shane Rose there. Now, we were sort of discussing that um, recent uh, Tokyo silver medalist Shane copped a near-fatal kick to the head which put him in a coma and we heard you guys, you were the only person there on that day. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah, yeah. Um, I was actually with Shane at the time. Shane and I were just riding a couple of mm-hmm. his pre-trainers and we were down the back of the property. and We were staying with them in between events. Some events at, yeah. at Sydney. And um, mm-hmm. so Shane, anyway, he had one. He decided he wanted to long rein into the barriers and it wasn't, wasn't going in. And I was on another one. And anyway... He whacked it. He was standing a bit too close, obviously. It kicked out and mm. right in the face. Oh and I, 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 rem, I remember now is like um, if a horse kicks a timber rail, a six by two fence rail, and you just hear it go crack, that's the noise heard. I heard. heard. And then oh because oh. the horse I was on was getting a bit worked up and running around, leaping about. Anyway, I look back. And there's Shane just flat out on the ground. I'm like, mm, what am I going to do now? So I ride over to him. I get a bit close. I jump off and he's rolling around going, oh, oh. I said, oh, you're alive. Um, oh, oh. Oh, I'll be back. Don't move. Whatever you do, don't move. So I rode back to the stables. I don't know where his horse went. Um, there was one other girl there and sort of... It was a weekend. Yeah, and back it? then you didn't have an iPhone or a phone. Like I didn't have a phone on me and I, there was this other girl there and I said, oh, what's the address of the property? So I was going to go to his stable phone and like ring an ambulance. Ring an ambulance. And I think she was a foreigner and she had no idea. So then I went, oh. So I grabbed, I said, here, take my horse. And there was this old feed car there. So I jumped in the car (laughs) and drove back down to Shane, who was in the paddock. And he's lying there with his face down because I said, look, keep your head to the ground. And um, I picked him up, chucked him in the front of the car. And I don't even think it had a door. I think the back door was off it or one front. It had, there was no ridge. It was your, your just pat, hay your, and your paddy wagon. Yeah. It. Yeah. yeah. I went, oh, oh I will, I'll just take you to hospital. So not more. I didn't, I didn't oh go. Way to Camden no. even, coming from the country. So this must stop. have been so scary. Like you're laughing about it now. Like we're all like, oh, ooh, ah, but oh my god, I can't yeah. believe at the time yeah. you must have just been like yeah. hearing that there noise. This, well, there's all this blood, and then we're in the car, and he keeps going, oh, does it look? Is it all right? And I looked <laughs> at him, and like his nose was over here, and every, and I went, oh no, it's all right. We just got to get to a hospital. <laughs> 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 Oh, my God, I can't believe when you looked at it, you didn't drive off the road. That was some serious, like, well and done. Then, oh, then, the, then there was there. roadworks on the way to the hospital. Mm. So there's the lollipop man, and I'm going, and there's one lane and this wiggly little road, and they had closed it, and the stop sign's up. So I drive up to it, to the lollipop man, and I'm, like, pointing to Shane in the passenger's seat, and he's gone, oh, oh. you can go. <laughs> so, oh. <laughs> thanks. Oh, my yeah, God. I managed, and by the time. I managed to just, I just drove him to the, um, like, straight up to in the ambulance bay. And then I just, like, I was bashing on the door um, to get them to open it up. Yeah. And then they came out to me and went, oh, now you can look after him now that he's here alive. <laughs> Yeah. Oh my! You're his God. hero. What was the first thing that? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Was it? 
Nikki's wife say? She wanted him to have reconstructive surgery, so uh, she she took, she took him. <laughs> um, she took the doctor's a photo. Like he was in an induced coma for quite a while, couple, a week or oh, ten days. Yeah. And and they said, oh, can you bring in a photo of his face because he needed his cheekbones were all broken and everything was broken, mm. and um, and yeah, she joked and she said, well. I'll bring in a photo of Brad Pitt and you can make him look like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was pretty funny. I mean, you know, oh, she kept her sense of humour about her as you had to. Yeah. And really yeah. scary time. Yeah. Yeah, you must have seen a few things in your time too. And to be, I think as writers we do, we see all sorts of, you know, accidents or injuries, whether it's, you know, a friend's falling off or a horse is sticking a leg through a fence or something and, I must say, the amount of times I've looked at something and gone, ah, oh, that's not ideal and had to kind of deal with the fact that it's all over the place and there's blood all over the joint, but you've still got to be able to keep functioning and actually get something done first aid-wise, yeah. haven't you? So that's a fair effort, mm. Well, it actually, um, he told me it moved the sh- it would hit him that hard that it dislodged the shoe on the horse. Um, so that's how uh, hard. <sighs> Oh, he was so lucky. He was so lucky. And I know Shane's had loads of injuries over the year because when we had him on, he told a little bit about those. So to come through that one, that is just incredible and still be out there riding to the level and getting silver medals. Hey, how horse riders, tough breed, huh? (laughs) Tough or stupid. Yeah, Yeah. bit of both. Yeah, that's why we keep doing it. A bit of both. Should we have some fun and do some, um, like, questions about Australia and New Zealand and the differences and see whether Charlie and the crew can get the answers. Yeah. yeah. Okay. See some of that? <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Okay. So guys, who invented the plastic banknote? The plastic banknote? Yeah, your note, your money, your currency that you've got over there. They're all plastic, aren't they? Plastic banknote. Like classic oh. banknote. Is that Australia or New Zealand? Australia. Yeah. <laughs> you're right you're right on it Blair yeah I've got it <laughs> okay what about Russell Crowe where do you think Russell Crowe is from New Zealand, New Zealand. <laughs> yeah he was born there but I think he still considers himself an Australian doesn't he yeah, yeah. <laughs> where were lamingtons originated from Ooh, good New question Zealand. yeah I reckon it might be a Kiwi thing actually no idea. No, it's Australia. It's Australia. Oh. <laughs> okay, guys. Where, where, where is the pavlova from? New Zealand. Yes, Blair. Yes. Oh, <laughs> it's also New Zealand. No, it, it, no it's, it is. The pav is a New Zealand It thing. is. Yep. Yeah, according to my oh, questions, it is. <laughs> and which country eats more meat pies? Australia or New Zealand? Australia. Australia. Well, Australia would have got the biggest pop- oh. bigger population. Well, what have you said with it in comparison to how many people are in that country versus people? Australia. Oh. I uh, would say uh, Oh. No. It's New Zealand. Like... 15 <laughs> per person versus Australia 12 per person. 15, right. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. You are the quiz I, I'm, aren't I? I'm liking this position yeah. right here. In fact, we should do this again with some British yeah, questions right. chucked in. I'm sure we eat lots of pies over here too. Well, I eat a fair few pies. You eat yeah, we do eat pork pies. What a Brit. So you could ask some Yeah, they're not the questions. same though. No, no, no. Pork oh, pies aren't the same as the meat pies. Oh, what, the pies? No. Oh. No. Mm, no. <laughs> no. We can oh. agree on that one. Oh. Okay, who has more sheep? Who's more sheep? Yeah, oh, Australia and New Zealand. Big. New Zealand, it's a big sheep country. Ooh. It's known for its sheep. Yeah, per person, but who has more sheep overall? Oh, well, oh. Australia would. Uh, so, so yeah, the there you go. Oh, awesome. All right. Well, let's do a couple of questions to, to wrap up. Um, Nikki and Blair, if you could turn back time and tell your 18-year-old self something, what would it be? Oh, goodness. I reckon, I don't know what I'd tell myself, but when I was 18, I was 
living the dream. I finished school. I didn't go to uni. I came home. I rode horses. I was having lessons, um, working. If I could go back there again, I would. I don't know if I would change anything. I think they were the best time, days of my life. I'm a bit the same as Nikki. I don't know if I'd change anything. I never went to uni. Um, all I've done is ride horses. I don't know anything different. Um, but I reckon probably one thing I need to do is learn how to cook. Um, so I reckon <laughs> I'm, even today at lunchtime, who does, who does I found a meat pie and put it in the microwave and that was my lunch. Um, so <laughs> probably one thing I need to do. Should have done was learn how to cook a bit more. Right. Okay. Who does all the cooking? Nikki, is that you? Correct. <laughs> right. Okay. It should be a lockdown activity. Blair does the cooking. We're going to come and film this. <laughs> um, now, what's it like working with family? Like, really? Like, Charlie, yeah, do you, you need to ask Charlie more questions. all the time? Or sometimes yeah, no, are they just like. It gets a slightly frustrating sometimes, but overall, it's great. I've got two very inspiring parents, but in, yeah, it gets a little bit frustrating every now and again. But because we've got, because we're like, got so many common interests, it makes it a lot easier. Yeah, that's so great. I mean, to have been growing up with such good role models as your mum and dad, and to be able to nick your dad's horses as well to take them out competing and then beat him in the ring. I mean, <laughs> doesn't get much better than that, does it? <laughs> and so what guy, what advice do you guys have for any aspiring riders out there picking the first racehorse off the track? I reckon go for it. Just follow your dream if it's what you want to do. Grab a racehorse. They, they are easy to get. Um, and... Yeah, just just go for it. Do just do what you want to do. As I said, Nikki and I, neither of us went to uni. We we haven't got any qualifications, and um, we love riding horses and we love producing them. and And um, we've loved all the competitions we've done, which have taken us, you know, around the world. Um, yeah, and yeah, we've had a great time. Yeah, I also think like if 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 they're lo- if someone wants to get a thoroughbred off the track, they've got to be pretty careful as well. Um, uh, there are a few people out there that um, see a, a, a free horse or a cheaper horse that they can start with, but they have no, not not a lot of knowledge about horses or thoroughbreds. Mm. Thoroughbreds mm. are actually pretty pretty flighty and, and tricky horses, um, especially if they've come from racing. So you have to be careful and, and have um, good advice um, from someone that knows something about thoroughbreds before you take one on. Mm. Yeah, so making think- sure you have some professionals surrounding you and you've got someone that you can go to to help Absolutely. in those tricky times when you're going through the development stages and getting used to your horse. The support network team is so important. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think, completely. Do you think too, that the, the new retraining programs that um, the, uh, like I know the VRC is a huge retrainer program, which I, I love seeing the thoroughbreds go to those middle people. So do you guys also have that program? So the horses come off the track and then they basically go to a retrainer and they spend time with the retrainer becoming a performance horse and they get sort of gauged and graded onto what ability they think they're going to be best suited to. And then anybody that's looking for a thoroughbred can go to the retrainer and that way they've already got that information. They know exactly if the horse will suit them. They can be guided in the right direction. So is that something that you guys do as well? Um, no, we don't We do not do that at all. And I know, I know um, Victoria is sort of further ahead than racing New South Wales. Um, Mm -hmm. I know that that's their plan, that's starting to happen, that sort of thing in in New South Wales. Um, But, no, look, we just basically, for us, we just concentrate on our business, our Mm -hmm. own performance horses, and um, uh, just are looking ourselves for for our own performance horses and help someone local if they want. Uh, the guidance and the help with it um, is what we do. 
Yeah, oh, fantastic. Well, I do. Yeah, I love what the VRC are doing and they have both the retraining program. They also have the reset program, which is for the thoroughbreds that may have had an injury or their temperament's a little bit trickier. So basically those ones also get that chance of having a second life. And um, like, I'm like you, I think like Zazi being my, you know, last little thoroughbred who was listed for Tokyo. I just think that when you get a good thoroughbred, they are such outstanding horses with incredible work ethics. So um Fantastic yeah. to see you guys with this huge business, you know, like you said, didn't go to uni, you're passionate about horses. Um, you've now made this incredible business all based on that and you're still competing at the same time. So I think that's a huge incentive for people that really love horses and are passionate to show that you can have a fantastic business and the whole family's involved. And yeah, it's really amazing. And, and thank you so much for sharing all of that with us. I know. Thanks for having us on the show, um, Amanda and Bex. It's been been enjoyable on the on the on the show. Uh, <laughs> yeah. well, what is it called on the on the podcast on the the on equestrian, the equestrian experience. experience? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. It's so interesting. No, it was so interesting just to hear all your story about all how the racehorses go through the process and how you built up your business to what it is now. So when I come over to Australia, I'd love a fully guided tour, please, of your property. Oh, me too. Anytime. Yeah, well, I was almost thinking we should take the computer around and show no. a bit of the, yeah. where, you know, <laughs> the footage. We have to get our technology up to date, but that would be yeah, awesome yeah, for the future. Yeah. Uh, that would be fantastic. It would be great to see it firsthand. So thanks, guys. Anyway. Yeah, thank you. Look, this has been the Equestrian Experience with myself, Amanda Ross, my co-host, Bex Mason, and this episode's guests, Blair, Nikki, and Charlie Richardson. So to send in your questions for our upcoming episodes, enter our competitions and access our other episodes, be sure to visit the Equestrian Experience podcast.com. And you can also follow us at Amanda Ross Equestrian, at Bex Mason Show Jumping and find the Richardsons at Vantage Hill Scone. So up until next time, have a great equestrian experience and thank you again, Bex and wonderful Richardson family. Thank you. Uh, thank you, guys. Thanks, Bex. See you. Nice to meet you, Bye. Bex. Bye. Bye. Bye.